Draft night. Yes, sir. Number four overall to the Miami Heat. Now, I want to hear your full draft day story, but before we go there, I'm wondering, how does it play into 21, 22-year-old Glenn Rice's head going to a franchise that was only in its second year of existence mm -hmm. that needed you to be an all-star, really, right away? They, yeah. There was no time. Some of the guys who got drafted ahead of you were able to learn on the job. Yeah. The Miami Heat needed Glenn Rice right away to step in and be a player. Yeah, it was uh, <clears throat> going up to that day, draft day. I mean, it was it was it was one of those moments where you look at and you say, OK, this is the moment. Uh, it's, you know, I worked hard, you know, throughout my young career and up to this point. And, uh, that night is finally here. Uh, it was it was what all the hard work and everything had come forth to be. Hearing your name called, it, it's such a relief. Uh, when they when the Miami Heat, uh, when they said the number four pick for the Miami Heat is Glenn Rice, I was I was thrilled to death. Uh, a dream came through. I was th I was thrilled for my family, and yeah, I knew the situation in Miami. I, I knew that uh, going into it, it was a good chance that I could be on a franchise who was at that time was going to be in its second year mm -hmm. in the NBA. But I didn't let that pressure get to me. I didn't I didn't I didn't put undue pressure into me to go in there and. Uh, carried a load like that. Uh, right. This was a, a different level. It was a, a level that was new to me. I knew that, you know, going in, I had, I had, to, I had to have expectations, but I, I knew I couldn't put them too high to the point where uh, I was going to put too much pressure on me, and then I'd be a failure right. in some sense. So I went in there with like, okay, you know what? I think the year before they won like 17 games. Okay, well, if we can go in there and win anywhere from 17 to 25 games, then I think that would be, you know, a successful season. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we end up winning 18 or 19. So it was in between the 17 <laughs> and the 25, so it was a successful <laughs> yeah. season. Uh, uh, for me as an individual, I, I had to go in there and, you know, just keep doing what I, you know, was doing. Uh, it was a learning process. Let me tell you, it was – for me, it was a struggle in the beginning. Because, was yeah, I – in college, I was so much bigger than everyone. I was able to run off screens. I was able to post up guys that were, you know, not as strong as I was or as tall. So it was, it was easier. Mm -hmm. Getting to the pros, <laughs> God, I had guys like Scottie Pippen, you know, Dale Ellis. All these guys were my height, just as strong and even quicker. And the defensive level was, I mean, it was like it went from here to here. So the intensity level was a, a great deal more. So I had to basically start all over and learn how to get open without the basketball. And right. then when I got the basketball, I needed to learn how to get to the next step. And that was either to be able to take one or two dribbles, shoot the jump shot, or be able to go all the way to the basket and finish. And you know what I love about your game so much is that not only did you play with that joy of, of the, the first – you play the joy of, 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 a, of a basketball camper, right? Like, you, you were, it was clear you were there and having fun, but also you weren't afraid to, I mean, there was a fire in your belly. I think about those times when, you know, you would sort of get nose to nose with Michael and, and make yeah. sure that they knew that the guy who's out there having fun is, is not just out there having fun. He also wants to kick your tail. Did, those, did you ever find that those two things were hard to reconcile with each other, the joy and the fire, or do they go hand in hand? I think they go hand in hand. I think any time you want to be successful, if, you, if you're a competitor, you're going to go out there with that. You're, you're not going out there with a disrespect, but at the same time, you're not going to go out there and be disrespected. Right. I think you, you have to go out there and just like they're trying to serve notice that they're there, well, you best believe that I need you to understand that I'm here as well. And <clears throat> for me, it was, it was not easy at all not to back down from anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got your first taste of the trade world before the 95-96 season when Pat Riley, sort of freshly hired, right. sends you to Charlotte for Alonzo Mourning. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can reflect on the way you learned about the trade, how you handled that news, <laughs> And then what it was like at six years into your NBA career, show an all-star already, showing up in a new locker room. What was that like? Yeah, that was, that was tough. Was it? I mean, that was my first time really understanding the, the business side sure. of the NBA. I was in Miami up until that point for six years. 
So I was, you know, I had my roots and everything. I was grounded. Yeah. You know, I was loving what I was doing in Miami. I was used to the fans there. I was, you know, it was home. We talked about the trade. Before the trade even happened, we had talked about it, me, myself, Pat Riley, and the family, and, and it was something that we didn't want to happen. Uh, the Charlotte Hornets, they had their franchise player in Alonzo Mourning at the time, and so they pretty much said, well, if we're going to get your franchise player, then we need, you know, you mm -hmm. got to give up Glenn Rice because he's your franchise player. And it was hard. Uh, I was going, we had a game that next day in the morning. I was going out to my car and I got the phone call that, that I had been traded. And I was like, okay, well, let me turn around, <laughs> go back in the house. And <laughs> yeah, it, it was a moment where, you know, I, I'm not afraid to say it. Yeah, I, I, I bursted out in tears. And because I, the reason why I was crying is because I was, leaving behind a legacy here in Miami that I, I was building up to be something special. And it still is special. Uh, but the hard part was saying, okay, wow, I got 48 hours to get my entire family to another city. And, right. and then in that, getting adjusted to, you know, a new area, new teammates. And uh, basketball I wasn't worried about because basketball, all you're doing is changing jerseys. It's still basketball. But uh, just being familiar with the next city I was going to, and uh, yeah, it, it, it to concentrate was difficult because yeah. you got so many things going on in your head, and um, you didn't know where to start. And and without the help of my uh, family and my teammates, it probably would have been a whole lot more difficult. I bet. I mean, but then of course in Charlotte, things really go. I mean, you became. Yeah. The elite Glenn Rice there, still the same game, but there yeah. was something about Coach Dave Cowens in that city, in that system. May I ask what it was about the city? Well, you, like you know, it's funny because uh, I was saying this uh, a couple of months ago. What made me be able to transfer over into the new Glenn Rice is the fact that I was with Pat Riley for about a month and a half, two months, and if any of you guys know the history of Pat Riley about his training camps. We got our butts kicked. He, no, really, he, he whipped me. I, I always took pride in being in shape. This man, I'm t this was like boot camp times 10. And not only did he get me in shape, but he taught me how to be a much better basketball player. Okay. He taught me how to be a much better leader. And with those teachings, I was able to take it over to Charlotte and imply them and Man, I tell you, it worked out perfect. And, and I owe a lot to Pat Riley because I think without the way he pushed me, surpassed where I had ever been uh -huh. mentally and physically, probably wouldn't have happened that way. Gosh. It's, he's one of the, I mean, obviously, he's looking down on us, right? One of those uh, mesotints yeah. up there. But, but to, to know that that, that, that kind of – that there, it is possible to inspire someone who's already one of the top – 20 players in the world to go even higher is remarkable. It's, it's very popular. He's, he's that type of individual. He's a, he's a great motivator. Uh, he, he, he has you believing in the impossible. Uh -huh. And uh, that says a lot about who the man he is. It does. Now, here's the part that I was telling you about before. After this next question, I only have three questions left for Glenn Rice. After that, it's yours. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask you, which ones of you have a question for three-time All-Star, NBA champion, NCAA champion, high school champion, Glenn Rice? So after this question, throw your hands up, and one of the great Hoop Hall staffers will come around and select a handful of you. Let me put this out there, too. You don't, yeah. don't, don't be afraid to mention that I am the three-point champion. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that you, you, you can't, when we talk about shooting, you can't forget that. I won't let you forget no. about that. <laughs> Touche. That ball came out of your hand differently than it did, it did everyone else's. Um, that's a lot of hard work, right? That was, because uh, the ball leaves your hand, and it, it's sort of like with the great home run hitters, it sounds different coming right. off the bat. With you, it looked different coming out of your hand. You know, it, it, I, I put a lot of hard work in. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I... I truly believe in my heart that, you know, it was a, it was a gift from God. It really was. Yeah. All, all I did was just put it up in the air. And, and, you know, with God, I mean, things don't go wrong. And, 
And uh, if it missed, it was only because he wanted to miss. Not had nothing to do with me. And, s- and, and so that's why it was so beautiful. I swear when you shot the hoops, the rims expanded like three inches. They went through so yeah. clean. It never hit the rim. Let me I don't tell think you. I ever saw you hit the rim. It was a lot of times I thought that rim was as big as this table yeah, here. So. Yes, it looked it. <laughs> yeah, but that, you know, that, that just goes to show you. I mean, when you, when you, when you have a craft and yeah. it doesn't have to necessarily be in basketball, it could be, you know, in your school, you know, a particular subject that you're really good at. If you if you work at it and work at it and work at it, I mean you could you could really uh, give yourself a, a chance to be at the top level. Well, in '99, um, you get dealt again this time to the Lakers mm-hmm. to one of the rosters, Lakers fans, yes, <laughs> to one of the rosters. When you win that title in 2000, I mean that roster when you go through it, obviously you, Shaq, Kobe, Ori, Fox, Sally. And right. all of these guys, you were all veterans. Yes. So how the heck, I just censored myself. I deserve extra credit for that. <laughs> how the heck did a group of NBA veterans all decide that it was all about a title and not about statistics? Because that's how it looked from the outside. Was that conversation had, or did you even have you, to have it? You know what, when you're, when you're dealing with veterans... You don't have to have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, we understand what has to be done. Uh, we also, I mean, it, it helps. I mean, you mentioned the Harpers, you mentioned the Rice, Fox. It helps to have a Shaquille O'Neal and a Kobe Bryant. It does. I mean, I'm not going to deny that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you got one of the guys in Shaquille O'Neal, who's probably, in my mind, one of the most dominant players uh, to play the game of basketball, and Kobe, who is, God, he's like a carbon copy of Michael Jordan. I mean, that. I, our job was easy. All yeah. we had to do was knock down a couple of jump shots, <laughs> and make it a little easier in the paint, give them a little room to operate, and uh, that was it. And, and of course, uh, <clears throat> it goes without saying, when you have one of the greatest minds of all time and Phil Jackson being uh, at the top there uh, with his leadership, it's not a whole lot that can go wrong. It's, when it goes wrong, it's... We're pointing the finger at uh, something happened on the floor. And I <laughs> yeah. mean, like, the floor, period. <laughs> <laughs> Someone flattened the tire of the bus yes. or something, yeah. yeah. All right, do you have a question for Glenn Rice? Put your hands in the air right now, and one of the great Hoop Hall staffers will come around and recognize a handful of you. Here they come. So since your career has ended, Glenn, yeah. you've maintained a foothold in this game that... Um, that again, the game is better off because of, you know, you still work for the Heat, um, you do uh, some media stuff, you're, you're a father of a player, yeah. right? I mean, you are in the game still. What has been most surprisingly fun about post-playing basketball for you? Well, I mean, like you said, I mean, for me, the, the opportunity to, to be able to go night in and night out and just be with the people that have supported me throughout my career. I mean, that, for me, that's, that's the utmost gift I could ever receive because I truly enjoy being able to bring a smile on, whether it be a young kid or an elder person. I, I enjoy seeing them smile. And, and to me, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I love yeah. that. My final question, as we sit here beneath um, all of those who have gone before us, you had mentioned that this was uh, your, your maiden voyage to the hall. So what yeah. is this moment like for all of the accolades, all the titles, the three-point title? Um, the, <laughs> I got it in that time. <laughs> you got it. Uh, what is the, how, do you, how do you contextualize this moment right here, sitting on center court at the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame? This is breathtaking. I mean, it's, it's, it's surreal. I think when you, do, when you think about just basketball in itself, this is where it all started. And then when you look around and you look at all the players who paved the path for what I was able to do, I mean, it's, it's just a blessing to be in this hall and uh, be in a hall of fame with all these people. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Rice. Thank you. So now I told you, 
I told you before that the hard questions are coming, and I promise these are the hard ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I only have two, two requests. One is that you allow me to hold the mic, and the second is that um, you introduce yourself to Mr. Rice before, uh, before you ask your question. So how are you, sir? Okay, my name is Jennings. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, yeah. Mr. Rice, out of all your uh, accomplishments in basketball, what season or year gave you the most satisfaction? <clears throat> I, 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 I would have to say, being able to go with the, to the Lakers and win a Nas I mean an NBA championship. The reason why I say that is, is be, you know, before you get to the NBA, there's two things you want to do, uh, part of your dream. One is to be an NBA player. I had an opportunity to be that. Two is to put yourself in a position to win an NBA title. And I was blessed to be able to be in that position and to be able to achieve it. Thank you. It's an honor. been an honor, Mr. My man, Thank you got it. Thank I, you, Mr. I, hey, I'm glad you was able to uh, have your uh, bucket list kick. <laughs> yes, sir. How are you, sir? Hey, fine, thanks. <clears throat> hey, hi, I'm Mike uh, Gillette from Halifax in Canada. Love watching you play. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'm a coach at home, try to teach people how to shoot a bit. Okay. For those players that don't have that relationship with God that you do, in that much detail. What kind of things fundamentally did you practice? What goes through your head when you shoot? Just things that I could learn and then go home and say, okay, I, I came up with the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's a great question. Uh, I, get that, I get asked that a lot. Of, I think, um, and you have a lot of teachers out there, they teach in many different ways. I think the best way to get a, a, a shooter to become a great shooter is to keep it simple. I think basically you gotta make sure you have the balance. You gotta make sure your technique is tight. And more importantly, you gotta make sure you're willing to go beyond working on it. Because if you just go and work on it, you're saying to yourself, I just wanna be an okay shooter. If you wanna be a great shooter, you have to go beyond the stars. That's how you become a great shooter. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mike. That's a great question. Hey, bud, how's it going? Celtic pride. <laughs> uh, my name is Miles, and I, um, I didn't watch a lot of your game, but I've watched highlights, and what I want to know is you played with one of the greatest players of all, I mean, not played with, but against one of the greatest yes, players sir. of all time. How would you describe the experience to play against Michael Jordan? Oh, my God. Let me tell you. <laughs> it was almost like you are playing against God, but we all know that can't happen. <laughs> when, uh, when I, and the reason why I, I, I really truly believe that Michael Jordan is the best player to ever play the game of basketball, <clears throat> and the reason why I say that is because you'll never find a competitor who is as fierce on both ends of the floor, like a Michael Jordan. The leadership, uh, the, the ability to, to make guys that are around him play above their level, uh, it, it's incredible. And to be able to play against him makes you even want to, you get, you get fired up. And we've had a lot of competitive battles. I mean, it's, the respect level that we have for one another, it's, it's huge. And, if it wasn't for Michael and Scottie Pippen, uh, you know, going out and really trying to understand, I'm playing against probably two of the best combo defensively. Uh, they, they helped me, and that's why I was able to continue to, to succeed on an offensive level because I, don't get me wrong, I could never play defense the way these guys played, <laughs> never. I mean, my defense was a better offense, and that's what I tried to do. Thank you. Great opportunity. Excellent, excellent question. If I'm not mistaken, this is the Laker fan. I think this is the Laker fan. That right, is the Laker is. fan. I, yeah, I, I seen him back there. Yep. Showtime. How, how you doing? My name is Robert Childros. I'm from Schenectady, New York. How you doing? And my big question for you is now, you know, I know that we got LeBron. Obviously, that's a good addition to our Lakers. Right. Um, I want to know the difference between going from um, the Lakers in 99 and 2000 to go into the Knicks from the next year, the, the next following year. Like the big market, the big market. Oh, market wide. Yeah. Well, you, I thought you was trying to get me in trouble. No, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to skip out on that question. Well, uh, market wise, I mean, yeah, it, it's really kind of, it's, it's kind of easy to see. I mean, when you look at New York, I mean, you got all the, the billboards and everything yeah. downtown. You got all, you know, a lot more of the shoe companies and whatnot. And uh, uh, market-wise, it's a little easier in New York because it's 
this is the big city. Yeah. L.A. at the same time, it's because it's, you know, it's, it's history. Uh, Showtime with Magic Johnson and all right. those guys. And now uh, with Kobe Bryant, now you have uh, LeBron James out there. Uh, it's the TVs, the TV cameras are going to follow yeah. the superstars. The marketing departments, they're, they're going to chase the superstars. So I think uh, in a sense you can kind of say that out in L.A. they're, they're catching up with the uh, glamour of the New York. I can say when you played, the games weren't on at 1030 <laughs> at night. Okay, <laughs> And I hope they ain't going to be on at 1030 at night when LeBron plays. Right. Thank no. you so much. for your You got it, buddy. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> I told you these were the hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Sam Leonard. Frustrated Nick fan from uh, <laughs> Queens, New York. Okay. So what I wanted to ask was, and if, if I close my eyes, I could see your jump shot. You know, and you'd stand there kind of straight, ball be high over the head, and it uh -huh. would be, sometimes it would hit the back of the rim, but a lot of times just go right through and just go right down. So the other teams, you were the scorer. Who, were, who was the most challenging defender? Because I'm sure they'd put a guy on you to deny you the ball. And who, so who was the most challenging defender you had to play? Not the hardest, because I know no one was hard. <laughs> when you were scoring, you were scoring. <laughs> but who was the guy you said, oh, snap, they got this guy on me tonight, and it's going to be a little more of a challenge? You see that guy with my right shoulder? <laughs> Every single night. I, <laughs> I lost sleep because of that man, because I was preparing so hard. It, it, you know, him and Scottie Pippen, like I said earlier, it's... It was, a, it was a huge challenge, and at the same time, it was, it was a treat because one of the things as an offensive player, and when you know that you have the capabilities of uh, being a, a really good scorer, uh, one guy or guy that has to uh, have good games in order for your team to have a chance to win, you, you stay up and, and you try and find ways of, of getting an advantage over a defender. And... Uh, with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, it, it was countless hours that I would try and, you know, I'd go back and I'd watch film and I was like, oh, okay, I see they played me a certain way when I went over the screen this way, or if I posted up, they played me a certain way over my left or right shoulder. So I, I had to constantly try and find new ways of trying to score. And it, it was a huge challenge, but at the same time, when you're trying to achieve the best, you know, when you're trying to get the most out of your talent, you don't mind working that hard. Pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Hey, buddy. New York. New York is rolling in here. Hi, my name is Ellis. I'm from New Jersey. Um, what was your favorite team you played on of your whole career? <coughs> That's a great question. Uh, I've been asked that question many times. And for me, I, I would have to say that all the teams was my favorite because I can take a little bit from each one and it, it makes who I am. Uh, for instance, when I was in Miami, you know, it was like the birth of Glenn Rice in the NBA. When I went to Charlotte, it was Glenn Rice becoming, you know, the teenager into a young adult because my game had matured so much more. When I got to the Lakers, I was okay at that pinnacle where now I'm a champion. I'm, I'm looked at as more of a leader, more so than any. And uh, when I went to the Knicks, it was like, okay, you are at the mountaintop. Now it's time to teach others how to get there. Uh, so that was my job and the, the help molding me as a player person uh, when I went to the, the Knicks, the Rockets, and the Clippers. And... Till this day, I'm still trying to teach young boys and girls like yourself to uh, continue to try and be a leader and get the most out of uh, success that you can. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Ellis. All right, rolling them in. Memphis Grizzlies. <laughs> the Grizzlies. Hello, my name is Andrew Coleman, and I'd like to know, well, as a player, what was it like to win a title and win awards after you've worked so hard? That's a great question. It, it was unbelievable. Uh, one of the ultimate goals is to, uh, to go out and, you know, be as successful as an individual as possible. Work as hard as you can to first uh, 
do whatever you can to help get the team to the next level. Along the process, there are opportunities where you may have the individual awards that you achieve along the way. And that's, that's I always say that's a bonus because I, I, I truly believe that uh, when you set your goals to be a team player, the, the, it's easier for the individual accomplishments to come. And the success, the success level is going to be that much higher. And then at the end of the day, the gratitude and the appreciation from all that hard work, not just as an individual, but as a, a team, it's going to be higher. Thanks, buddy. All right, want to keep it All right, look at the team question. I love this. It's, the, it's our own big three coming in. I like it. I like that big three. I'm good. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Rice. Uh, Likewise, thank you. We're the Myers family. I'm John, Avi, and Marcus. How We're you Michigan guys doing? State fans. That's I'll fine. To take you, you back to cut your college you know, days. You, and you know, I always, always tell people when, when they tell me they're Michigan State fans, we're out of Michigan, so we have the team together. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us what you remember about the rivalry back in the 80s. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah, that was. Steve uh, Smith's my favorite player. So and that, and that's you're my, my second favorite. That's my, that's my favorite guy as well. I mean, we, we still to this day have a lot of conversations. Um, it was huge. I mean, we're trying to, you know, find out who was, who was the, the best team in the state of Michigan. Uh, the rivalries were unbelievable. I mean, you hated us. We hated you in a respectful way. And at the same time, I mean, once we clashed, it was like some of the greatest basketball games uh, that had been in the history of those two teams. So uh, when I go out, first of all, I'm always trying to represent uh, Michigan the state of Michigan, and then the University of Michigan, and then as well, uh, Michigan State as well, because it is a part of Michigan. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Nice work. See you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I like that Goonies hat. That's a Goonies hat. That's fantastic. Uh -huh. Hey, bud, we're bringing in the closer. Here we go. Hi, I'm Kenneth Bertrand from South Burlington. How you and doing? in 1989, what was it like to have like a head coach change right before the March Madness tournament, and how did you overcome that? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, going into the NCAA tournaments, yes, we had uh, our head coach, Bill Frieder, who was uh, fired uh, because he, had, uh, he was taking another job elsewhere. It, it was difficult, but, but I think, especially for those who are Michigan fans, if, if, if you recall the name Bo Schembechler, who was our AD at the time, one of the most amazing individuals. He's like a Pat Riley. He, he was, when you talk about Michigan, he was the man that we all inspired to be. Uh, we all were, you know, we all looked up to him. We all wanted to make sure that, okay, we need to do this the way Bo Schembechler would do it. And uh, this man came in, he spoke to us before entering the uh, NCAA tournament. And to this day, when I tell you he gave us one of the most incredible, most outstanding, inspirational speeches ever, it was incredible. He had us thinking that, you know what, if they'd have put that team against an NBA team at that particular time, we would have came out on top. He had us believing that, that, that much. And, and for us, it was easy. It, regardless of who was stepping in and to, to – Steve Fisher's credit, he was the guy because a lot of the times throughout the season, he was the voice in practice. So that transition there was easy. Uh, for us as individuals uh, on the team, the basketball players, we were ready for it because we believed. And we, we, from day one, we were brothers. And we know another in order for us to get through the adversity at that particular time, that we were going to have to just come together that much tighter. And, and, and we did. And that's why we were able to go on and win the 1989 championship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. You might never see that again, the, the coaching change right before the tournament. That'll probably be the last time we see that. That's yeah, that was – I hope so. I mean, because that's, that's something you don't want to see, uh, you know, happening to a team or a university. Right. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you brought it today. Nice work. Yes, you did. <laughs> One more fantastic 60 Days of Summer round of applause for Mr. Glenn Rice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.